I am super excited to be here today with Dr. Fresco. He is a neuroscientist, but also a very successful entrepreneur. His company has been featured in Inc. 5000 for the Extreme Adventure Parks. He's also been personally featured very recently in Forbes magazine, in Thrive on MSNBC, and also um, in Inc. magazine multiple times. It's, I'm super excited to have you here. We've just finished a chat and it was so interesting that I can't wait to really quiz you on some of the topics here and share it with the listeners. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. And I'm excited to be here as well. Yeah, it's great. So to, um, to get started, I mean, there's so much. I first want to start with um, your um, skill set in terms of the brain and achieving a high performing brain and energy. Um, I know that you really value sleep as one of the kind of secret superpowers um, yes. in ensuring brain health. But if you could name the top kind of three to five things that people need to get right um, to have that enhanced cognition and focus, um, what would those be? So I would say, obviously, to have the reason why I believe in having a great brain is super important because I believe your brain dictates how successful you're going to be. If you are not, if your brain doesn't make the right decisions, right, you're going to, if you make poor decisions, you're never going to succeed in life. And in order for your brain to make the correct decisions, um, your brain has to be working uh, optimally, uh, in optimal, sorry. <laughs> uh, your brain has to be in optimal working conditions. So some of the things I tell people that you must understand and learn and, and focus on this, you know, nutrition or diet is extremely important. What you feed your brain, it's like, you know, I don't know if you heard of that phrase, we are what we eat. Mm -hmm. like, I highly believe it. If you are eating bad or junk food all the time, not only the rest of your body is going to be bad, you know, you're going to gain weight, you might raise your levels of insulin, of, of, of blood sugar, which might eventually develop into a diabetes. You might increase your uh, risk of heart disease, but you're also going to in influence your brain in a bad way. You're going to create brain fro fog. You're going to be slower. You're going to make poor decisions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the second one I would say is exercise comes uh, you know, kind of hand in hand with nutrition. Now, people ask me nutrition or exercise. Well, first, I say nutrition, right? If even if you want to lose weight, I think eighty percent of your weight loss comes from nutrition. The other twenty percent can be enhanced by your exercise. But exercise has been shown um, to enhance your brain as well. It it release it helps release endorphins and a whole bunch of different or a milieu of different chemicals that will enhance your brain power. Sleep, I would say number three, sleep. People neglect sleep a lot. Um, when you think about it, you sleep 33% of your time or you spend 33% of your time in life sleeping, which means, you know, uh, if, you have, if you're 100 years old, it means you slept 33 years of your life. So you gotta think, it must be an important part of our lives that we spend so much time on it. And people neglect it. You know, if, if they have to sacrifice anything, they usually sacrifice sleep. Oh, I got an exam tomorrow. That's okay. I'll sleep less. Oh, I got to go do this. That's okay. I'll sleep less. I'll sleep. It's always I'll sleep less. So sleep has a profound impact on your brain, especially when you sleep deprived cognitive functions go down dramatically. I mean, by dramatically means like 30, 40, 50%. And if you're very sleep deprived- with being like drunk, would you say, in terms of cognitive function? Um, you're really it can sleep be, yes. Yeah. It, can sleep deprived. it can be, it can be worse to the point that you can have hallucinations. Um, I've been in times where I was sleep deprived and I'm making so many mistakes and I can see them. I'm like, oh, another mistake, another mistake to the point. I'm like, I got to stop because, you know, and that's when accidents happen too. Um, on top of that, sleep cleans your toxin levels from your brain. That's when your brain decides to flush out all your toxins. So if you're not sleeping enough, a lot of that toxins don't get flushed out. So they accumulate more in your brain, which eventually also 
brings more problems to you. And would that be things like beta amyloid plaque that builds up in the brain if you're not sleeping enough? The what? The beta amyloid plaque. I know there's been some studies that we're kind yeah, of there's, cleaning there's that part away. You know, for those who are watching, she's talking about plaques that build, that eventually develops into Alzheimer's. Mm. Um, yes, it, there is a link. Now, that's not the only reason. Diet is a link too for Alzheimer's disease, non-exercising. Here's, here's one little tip for those of you watching who are over 60 years of age. Walking 30 minutes a day reduces the chances of you having Alzheimer's by 30%. So don't sit on your couch all day. Just get up and walk. And that's if you are over um, uh, 60 years of age. And here's another one that should alarm you. If you are over 85 years old, if I'm not mistaken, if you're over 85 years old, your chances of getting Alzheimer's is almost 50%. Wow. So it's you, very correlated with age. Very correlated yeah. with age. Part of it, it's not that it's age itself. It's everything you've done in your life mm -hmm. that eventually led to it. Did you know that about 90, it's, it's about 95, 97% of Alzheimer's cases could have been prevented if you led a healthy um, life with the proper diet exercise and you could have prevented. There's only three genes that are at the point, at this moment identified that are direct link to Alzheimer's, meaning you're born with these genes, there's nothing you can do about it, you will develop Alzheimer's. All the other cases, people that don't have those genes um, don't necessarily have to have Alzheimer's. You could be on that 50% that don't have it. And the only way to get there is by um, following the, you know, a, a good diet, exercise, and training your brain so that you can you know, live longer without Alzheimer's. You know, I'm actually... I wish I knew everything I knew today when I was 20 years old. I would have had even, you know, a healthier life. Now, I've never smoked. I've never tried any drugs. You know, some people might say, you're so boring. <laughs> um, but I wasn't. You know, I was a break dancer. I, I played lots of sports. I'm a martial artist. I did so many things in my life. I was a big prankster. So I don't need drugs or alcohol to get me um going and and, and being fun, fun, yeah. and fun without any drugs um but so that was a very big plus for me in my life because again never drugs no alcohol I, I, i've only been drunk once uh and that's only because i wanted to see what it felt to be drunk just as an experimental <laughs> basis um and in and terms of brain health would you advise to avoid alcohol entirely 100 percent yeah. There's okay. there's no now some people say oh drinking a glass of wine a day is is good for your heart. Yep, yeah, there's other things that are good for your heart too, not necessarily wine because the wine has the alcohol that you don't need. So people say oh but wine has resveratrol, which is an anti-aging thing. Well, berries have uh, anti-aging and antioxidant properties too. So drink eat berries. You don't need to or just eat alcohol. the grapes instead of drinking yeah. the wine. Or, or exactly, or eat yeah. the grapes and you'll get the same benefits. Now, it's, it's, it's a common human behavior. People use that as an excuse. Oh, I'm drinking a glass of wine because it's good for me for this. Yeah, but it's also bad for you for that. So, but, you know, that's how our brain works. So, anyway. What specifically does it do on the brain um, in terms of long-term damage, would you say, is the effect of somebody who regularly drinks alcohol? Um, I, would, I would love to show you. I don't have... Um, an image, but I would love to show you images from Dr. Amen's clinic studies. Yeah. If you look at a brain that has been abused by alcohol, you know, regularly, even people that have been drinking one or two glasses of wine a day, you can see holes in the brain activity. So activity levels of your neurons decreases. Um, there is actual physical changes that happen when you take drugs because alcohol is a drug. There's physical changes at the DNA level, meaning the expression of your genes get affected by the consumption of alcohol, by the consumption of cocaine or drugs or whatever. If you look at, um, at these brain scans, um, I'm actually going to send them to you. So some of the images, so you can yeah, post them with, the, with, the, with the, the before and afters, like people with now, the good news is if you stop doing it, it's reversible. 
it's some of this activity. This is alcohol and drugs or just alcohol? Alcohol okay. or drugs. Oh, yeah. it's revert, okay. Yeah. And how long does that process take? To, so for example, let's talk about cocaine, for instance. So cocaine, if you take cocaine, um, you've heard of the case where you start taking cocaine and then you need more and more cocaine to get mm -hmm. that same high. The reason why is because your brain is smart. Your brain goes, ooh, cocaine, this feels good. I like it. I want more. But when the brain starts seeing way too much activity, because that's what happens is you get super excited, so much activity, so much brain power, so much firing on your brain. What happens is your brain goes, wait, there's too much more. There's an extreme amount of activity. We've got to downregulate it. The only way to downregulate it is like, you know what? The surface of your cell has receptors and cocaine binds to these receptors. So what the brain does is says, we're going to eliminate some of the receptors so that it doesn't get so active so excited so then you take more cocaine because you're like the way it works is like you, your cocaine is floating around in that synaptic cleft where all the molecules are in and and they linger around as long as they can until they find a receptor so if you have less receptors you're going to have more cocaine lingering around and it takes a little longer for it to dissipate but the more you bring cocaine the more receptors go away so then it's a, this, this loop of like all of a sudden now you need like 35 kilograms of cocaine to get the same high you used to get with like, you know, one gram. I'm exaggerating, obviously. Yeah, but yeah. Um, so then now it takes about six months to a year. The good thing is like once you stop doing it, you're like, okay, you get clean. I'm not going to do cocaine anymore. You get clean. So your brain goes, great. Um, I'm going to start bringing those receptors back but it takes about six months to a year for your brain to go back to that normal state. So a year later, if you do a, a small line of cocaine, you're going to get that instant high again. That's why a lot of people that don't do it for one, two, three years, and then eventually try it again and they fall into that trap again, they immediately get hooked again because your brain obviously has that memory of like, Oh, this is awesome. And your brain came back to normal where now all these receptors are available. So you get that immediate like super high um, yeah, sensation. So, yeah. And what about sugar? Because from the, re the research I've read, sugar well, is as I love you asked that question. Sugar, if you look at a brain scan mm -hmm. of a brain on sugar or a brain on cocaine, they look identical. That's what I read, which sounds, I mean, it, it seems crazy, doesn't it? But I've seen, I've seen the scans. It's crazy. Now to me, in my, if you ask my professional opinion, I would tell you sugar is an addictive substance, just like cocaine. Um, the problem is that the health insurance in America would, would, would go haywire if all of a sudden we consider obesity or, you know, sugar consumption, all that stuff, consider a disease or a, or a syndrome or a condition because all of a sudden now all that stuff is going to have to be covered. So I think people don't, you know, the, the, I wouldn't say the government, I'm not a, a, a what's what you would call a um, conspiracy theorist, conspiracy theorist. I'm not a conspiracy, but I, I'm sure somewhere all out, all around the lines, it could be companies themselves. They do not want sugar to be, uh, consider or even obesity. Obesity is not considered a disease. To me, obesity is a, it's, it's part of a, an addiction process. Mm -hmm. People become obese because they're, uh, uh, um, because they are addicted to food. They're addicted to the effects of food. You know, there's chemists and I'm my first degree I ever gotten was a, I'm a, a organic chemist. They hire guys like me to work at companies like Kellogg's and, you know, all these uh, food companies to find the point where food tastes best and is the most addictive for you. That's what they do. It's not the greatest job in the world. They pay extremely well to do that. They call that the bliss point. And that bliss point is studied in detail. And the way they do, part of the way they study is they, obviously they mess with sugar, fats, and salt. And you can read a lot about this on, uh, I think it's Michael Pollan's book, Fat, Sugar, Salt, or, Sha or oh, Sugar, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I'm linked to that. Yes. Yeah. Um, you can read a lot about these studies there. 
Um, but basically, they grab a let's say group of kids and they say, okay, we're going to make Oreo better. How do we make it better? And they change either the, those are the three components they change: fat, sugar, and salt. Usually, now fat's been attacked for the longest time. Fat now it's coming on a rebound. It's research now showing that you do need fat. The fat is not as terrible as we used to think it is. Um, salt, there's controversial. Bear with me a minute. I'm just gonna just pause. Yeah, here we so, go. Uh, so I mentioned fats and then um, salt, it's controversial. There's scientists or there's research that shows that salt is good for you. There's research that shows that's bad for you. So it's, it's, it's like a 50-50. There's not much. But then it leaves sugar. So when, when the companies got attacked about fat and everything became fat-free, how do you increase the taste of a product so that you don't lose that, you know, it doesn't taste like something horrible that nobody will buy? So they started playing with sugar. Mm. So they grab these, say, six-year-olds, they bring them in a room, they give them all these Oreo cookies, and they're like, which ones you like better? And they test and test and test and test until they find the one that's like, this is the one that kids you seriously them. test this on children? 100%. Oh my goodness. Yeah, they test all the cereals, all the, all the stuff kids like get tested on kids. And the thing is, it's natural, isn't it, for us in terms of like self-preservation to like sweet things because generally those in nature would have been safer. Um, so they're really playing on that. Because I also heard that it's that almost lethal combination as well of sugar with like um, bad fats, kind of trans fats, that's really yeah. addictive and moorish. A hundred percent. It's the texture. And you were talking about the evolution of sugar. The reason why we love sugar so much or our brains crave sugar. You got to think two, 5,000 years ago, was there any sugar available? No. So the moment you found a tree with fruit, which was only seasonal, right? Yeah. You, you, you'd you be like, oh, awesome. You eat all the fruit you can. And then you know that for the next year, you won't have that tree. Or you might find that uh, honey a uh, hive from, um, you know, the beehive with honey in it and you score that awesome honey and you're like, great. Now you have all this energy um, that you can eat, but it was gone. You didn't have, you know, not, not even 5,000 years ago. I think it was 100 years ago, the average human consumed about five grams of sugar per day. Now the average human consumes about two, 300 grams of sugar per day. It's a huge in just a hundred years, right? Um, and that's what's bringing, what? We can't adapt quickly enough to cope. No, our brain takes thousands, thousands of years to make changes, right? And we're still, our brain still thinks like cavemen. They still think, oh, sugar, I need to get it because it's gonna be scars. It's something that I'm not gonna have in the future, so I need to save it and eat it now for you know because i'm not going to have it tomorrow but the problem is we live in a world that we're bombarded and we're you know there's so much visual contamination i always tell people it's like being addicted to food it's harder than being addicted to cocaine because what do you do with a cocaine addict you isolate them from drugs you put them in a center where there's no drugs you tell them he can't hang out with the drug addict friends anymore you put him in a circle of people that love him and protect him and and he's away from the drugs what do we do with obese people? We can't. It, he walks out the street and there's signs that show you eat McDonald's. There's smells that are coming from these um, corner uh, restaurants that point the, you know, and this is all part of marketing. They point all their exhaust tubes into the intersection. So when you stop in the red light, you smell it and you want to eat because you're, you, it wakes your hunger up and you go eat it. You watch TV and every commercial has food in it. You go to the supermarket and 85% of the products in a supermarket contain sugar. It's impossible for somebody that is addicted to food and sugar to be away from it. You go to a friend's house and they all have sugary pops and sodas and food and breads and it's it's almost impossible. The only way you gotta the only way is to isolate yourself, go in the middle of the mountains with the um monks and live there for a year then you truly probably be able to and drink know, lose some weight or commit some big big old crime and uh, and go to jail for a few years in some poor country then you <laughs> you definitely lose some and weight sugar so, um, so the main one so far right is sleep is a massive priority nutrition 
big one. Exercise, you were talking, um, boost it. I think exercise, certain types of exercise in particular, um, boost BDNF, don't they? Yes, BDNF, it's a, uh, that's one of the chemicals I was talking to you that boosts mm -hmm. when you're doing exercise 100%. And it's, it's crucial for your brain functioning. Mm -hmm. Then I would go number four. Um, I would say emotional intelligence. If you want to have a proper working brain, um, you've got to understand how emotional intelligence works. And for those of you who don't understand or don't know what emotional intelligence, you got, you got regular IQ, you know, your intellectual coefficient, which is which measures your intelligence, how smart you are. You know, Einstein had a super high IQ and probably the, the guy in your class that aced everything and was big nerd probably had a higher IQ than average. But emotional intelligence is something that not a lot of people have. And I, and, and, and what is it? It's, it's the intelligence that we have to deal with our emotions and other people's emotions and control and understand how other people. So being, for example, an empathetic person, uh, the more empathetic you are, the more emotional intelligence you have. And there is some tests online that you can take. There's a guy, what's his, I forgot his name, but he published a book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. He was one of the first ones to get into this topic, and he offers a free quiz. What? You have it? I have it. It wasn't Daniel Goleman. Uh, no, I don't think no. so. Oh, emotional intelligence. Yeah, it is. Daniel Goleman. Oh, it's okay. There it is. Daniel Goleman. Yeah. Yeah, Daniel Goleman. Okay, so you can, did he, he gives you a test that uh, you can take to see where you stand on your emotional intelligence. And there's two parts to emotional intelligence. There's the part of knowing who you are and controlling yourself and your emotions. And there's the part that's the exterior part, which is like understanding, becoming the other person, like stepping on the other person's shoes to try to understand what they're feeling and how you can react to it. The more you do that, the more you understand that, the better you're going to be because you could be, if you could have a super high IQ, but you're super awkward and you're antisocial, you're kind of rude. Well, nobody's going to like you. Nobody's going to want to work with you. They're not going to hire you. They're not going to uh, talk to you, right? So if somebody asks me, you know, would you rather have a high EQ or a high uh, um, IQ? I'd rather have a high EQ. Obviously, I prefer to have both. I'd, I'd rather have a high IQ with a high EQ. That's the perfect combination. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you this much. Most people that have a high IQ are successful. Most people that have a high IQ are not necessarily successful. And so that's, a high EQ correlates with success, but not necessarily a high IQ. Yeah, because you can be in kind of a background. But what would you say to people, I mean, as well to kind of parents, if you're trying to develop either yourself, better emotional um, intelligence, or certainly with children growing up, what are the best ways to develop that part of the brain? Well, the cool thing about emotional intelligence is that you can train it. It's not something, you know, IQ, there's different lines of for research, but uh, I'm more inclined on to like you're born with a certain IQ and you can't really change it. Um, now you can train to be better at certain things, but you can't really change. It's like, it's, it's, it, you could say it's mainly genetic. Um, but there's still scientists that say it's not, that it's 100% trainable. So it's, you know. It, it, it's still kind of a debate there. Um, EQ, on the other hand, is completely trainable. It's, it's now, there are obviously some people born with more EQ. There are some people that are born to be more empathetic than others. There's some people that are born to understand and, 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 and feel their emotions better than others. Um, for example, I have two sons, and one of them have a higher EQ than the other. And they were both raised in the same way, just one developed a, a better EQ than the other. But again, it's trainable. There's lots of things you can do to increase. Number one is understanding what EQ is and what are the things you can do to make it better. It's, it's, so once you're conscious about the things you can do, we're going in one minute. One of the things, it's at 11.15. One of the things, so one of the things you can do is understand what EQ does, what 
are the things you can change. And then just by knowing consciously that, oh, if I try to work on my emotional control, understanding how your body feels, like let's say, how do you react when you get angry? You start getting tense. You know, you like, once you can read your body language and be like, okay, I'm getting tense. My muscles are doing this. I'm starting to sweat or I'm getting angry and clenching my jaw. That means I'm getting angry. So what do you normally do when you're angry? Oh, my next step is usually I punch something or I hit the person or I will. Then maybe now when you're feeling those symptoms, you walk away from the situation, mm -hmm. right? Or something that I used to do. I used to get mad at people. I would write a nasty email and send it. And then I would regret it. What I do now is I control myself. I say, if I have to write something nasty, I write it down and I force myself not to send it for 24 hours. 24 hours later, I read the email. And usually, 99% of the time, I'm like, oh my God, I can't send this. And yeah. I, start, I start deleting curses and phrases and things. And sometimes I don't even send anything or sometimes I just make it so much more mild. And it's worked wonders for me, right? It's just taking that step. So that's all building up to your emotional intelligence. Like you gotta be smart enough to control your emotions and understand what other people are feeling too. Standing in other, stepping in other people's shoes at all times is important too. Because you might say, this is my opinion, but you got to put yourself, imagine there's a camera filming you from above and say like, now you're on this side of the world and be like, this is what this person is seeing. How would you see it if you were that person? Now it's a hard process, but it's doable. For young children, yeah. 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 So, but especially for young children. Yeah. yeah. It's hard, but it but it's doable. And like I said, everybody can get better at it. Eventually, to the point where you're like really, really good, and and have a really high emotion like you. I'm gonna pause here, so I can go take him. And um, <clears throat> okay, and so. Um, is there a fifth one? Um, I know when we were speaking earlier, we were talking about five things in terms of what would be the final thing that you would say is important for a really healthy and high performing brain? There is, there is you know, there's 10, 20, 50 things you can yeah. do. It depends <laughs> on your brain. But a fifth one that I would say it's important is obvi obviously learning. Um, learning gives you, one of the main things it gives you is confidence, right? for what you're doing. The more you know, the more confident you are, the more confident you are, you can sell yourself better. So I could say mm -hmm. learning and selling yourself kind of go hand in hand. And you know, something I wish schools would teach more often is techniques to help people to learn better or and, and as, at the same time, techniques to help you learn how to sell yourself. You know, persuasion techniques are very important to be successful. I mean, you're selling yourself all the time when you're when you want a job, you're selling yourself. When you have a product or a company, you need to know how to sell that product or company. When you're dealing with your wife or spouse or, or your, your relationship, you're, you're selling your side of the story. So they, you know, follow, they believe you, they do what you want them to do. So selling or persuading people is extremely important. But learning, in order to persuade, you got to be able to learn, right? To learn how to persuade. So learning is extremely important. Uh, important in my opinion because like I said it, it, it builds it helps you build that confidence and the more you know the better decisions you're gonna make right so if you have to decide between which foods to eat well if you don't know that this chicken nugget is bad for you compared to this uh, chicken breast that's grilled well you're gonna make you be like oh I'm gonna choose this one because your decision now is gonna be based on um, your feelings or past experiences or your pattern seeking behaviors so now it's like oh, i'm gonna eat the chicken nugget but if you get the knowledge like earlier i talked about alzheimer's if you walk 30 minutes a day you reduce your chances of getting alzheimer's when you're over 35 i mean uh, 65 years old so now you have that piece of knowledge right mm -hmm. so you understand now you can do something with it now it's your choice to say i want to lower my risks or not so learning per se is, is very important, right? Now, some people ask me too, it's like, well, there's 
learning like learning for school like to learn how to take an exam or learning you know learning learning is everything now obviously again i wish schools would have uh learning technique courses for you to be able to uh, learn better faster more efficiently you know memorizing techniques it's uh, people are always like oh, i can't remember names i can't remember this i'm bad with memory i don't have a good memory well that's all trainable now, yes, there's some people that are innately born with the ability to remember everything. Um, but in general, the average person doesn't. But there's ways that or things you can do to train. I mean, there, there's neuroscience studied techniques that will teach you exactly how to learn a specific topic. For instance, um, there is a, a, a way of uh, learning that's called interleaving, which means you you're studying a topic let's say you're in college and you have to you have to take an exam for biology a history course and you're taking i don't know a um, uh, philosophy class well most people usually study for the philosophy exam they study all the philosophy stuff then they move into the biology class and then they move into the next class ideally for your brain to work better it's like you you have to interleave it you have to like divide your time and say say you're going to study one hour today we'll study 20 minutes of biology 20 minutes of philosophy and 20 minutes of math or whatever your courses are and that would enhance yeah. the learning it but enhances the learning by a lot because what happens is you're forcing the brain to think out of the like go back and forward in between um topics and it breaks that pattern of like so, so if you study two hours of the same topic you're going to remember usually the first part of the stuff you learned and usually the last part and everything in the middle kind of gets lost because it's all part of the same topic. When you divide it into smaller chunks, it helps the brain because the brain is now jumping from one topic to the other and it helps it make better connections for those particular pieces of information. Um, dual coding is another technique that people use. Uh, and again, all these techniques have been studied in research labs with subjects and came down to like okay these are the better the best techniques for you to use to learn dual coding is something for example when you're learning it's better to learn words associated with images which for instance when i was studying biology i remember it was so much easier for me to study let's say the process of digestion by having a diagram in front of me that's showing me all the parts of digestion and just reading about it, right? So if you read, this is digestion and the stomach and blah, 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 versus you read all that stuff and you complement it. That's why it's called dual coding is you're coding two different types of information at the same time that are related to each other. So now you have, um, let's say that the, the digestive tract you know, showing you here's the esophagus, here's the stomach, what it looks like. When you retrieve all that information on that exam, the first thing that comes to mind is that visual image of the stomach or your digest the digestive system. And it's a lot easier to put things in place and be like, oh, this was the stomach. Oh, the food started up here in the mouth. And then it came down the esophagus and then it came down to the stomach and then went to the intestines and then it came out, you know, to the colon and then, you know, uh, everything comes out. So it's a lot easier to see it that way than if I give you a piece of text, read it, and you have nothing to compare it to. You don't have anything, right? Now, most people know what the digestive system is like, but if you've never seen, let's say, a brain, and I tell you, oh, the left and the right brain, and the shape of the brain, you, if you can't imagine it because you've never seen it, it's a lot harder to make uh, that type of information. Mm -hmm. So learning is, is, like I said, key to anybody's success. If you ask all top entrepreneurs, out there one of the things they do the most is read a lot now yeah there's different kinds of reading i always tell people when you're reading a book so this is this is my book this book is information like if you're reading a textbook from school the information in the textbook is all good it's all crucial information it basically condensed thousands of studies into one paragraph that tells you these are the important points so you can, for example, speed reading, right? There are speed reading techniques. I've tested them. I've used them. I use it. I use, you know, when I speed read and I'm concentrated, you got to be very concentrated. I can read up to like seven, 800 words per minute with a pretty high comprehension. 
because that's the important thing. You can read super fast, but if your comprehension level is 10%, then it's pointless. You're better off, what you want is high comprehension, um, no matter how the speed is, and then eventually develop the speed until you, as long as you're maintaining the comprehension. You want that speed. So if you, because obviously the comprehension is absolutely key. Yes. Uh, obviously, the more you read, the quicker you're going to become and the quicker you can assimilate that data. Um, reading fresh, I find I love to do my reading in the morning because I'm really fresh and alert, particularly if I'm trying oh, yeah. to digest a large volume research or something. But what, what tips do you have in terms of, because I think we could all read more if we could read faster. So tips. So um, one of the, so I'll give you just two or three basic tips. The first thing you grab a book, the first thing you do is read the back, see what people are saying or what's it about. Second thing I usually do is I go through the table of contents. Yeah, I do that. The table of contents gives me a very good idea of what I'm going to be talking in or what's going to be said in that book. So I read my thing. I'm like, okay, brains, the ways the brain can function, understanding yourself and others, um, personality, okay, biochemical machine, learning and memory, sleep, okay, uh, Dr. Fresco's play, you know, relationships, blah, feeding and caring of your brain, exercise, and so on. I get an idea. I'm like, okay, this book is really about uh, the care of my brain. Then the chapters that really interest you, um, get in there and read the first, I usually read the first page or the first few paragraphs. That will give you a very good indication of what that topic will be about. Now people are like, well, why do you want to do that? What, it, what you're doing is you're priming your brain to know what type of information to expect. So it's going to waste less time trying to figure out mm -hmm. um, associations and being like, oh, what's this book really talking about? Is this what it's talking about? Is this? So it, it gives you a shorter, you know, when you start reading all these topics, it, your brain goes, oh, I, I kind of know. And it goes with the flow. So that's the first things you should do before you read a book. Kind when of you want to get... read a bit of each, say you identify four or five chapters that you think, right, these are really interesting to me. Then you'd read the first few paragraphs of those chapters to kind of get an overview, engage your brain. So yes. that it's then fully focused. And then what, find the one that you want to read the most? Or at that point, would you go no, to... Oh, then let's say the four, you're like, okay, these are four really important chapters. You're like, now you go into the reading of the chapter and for one of the most common speed reading techniques is like you divide your, your sentence into three or four sections. And you, you know, the, the eye works in saccades, I think it's pronounced saccades or saccades, um, which is the jumping of the eye, like, right? So your eye doesn't go smoothly. It goes tick, 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 tick. So every time you look, it just jumps. It's like very like, uh, What's the word? Rhythmic, but it yeah. It's very quick. It's like it does. It does. It's not a smooth like. And and you guys watching this right now, try to move your eyes smoothly, and you're gonna see that it goes tick 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 tick. Oh, yeah, it does. In, in little um spaces, right? It it it's not like a car where it's smooth. It's like imagine a car going whoop whoop whoop, right? Yeah. Nonstop. So what you do is you train your brain to go, um, you know, I, this is too small, but divide this page into three spots and then your eyeball like for instance most people tend to start reading at the beginning of the sentence mm -hmm. what i would do is i put my eyeball right here right here and right here three okay. spots just to summarize what dr fresco is saying because some people are going to be listening to this on the oh. podcast and not seeing it so basically we're working across the page and you're kind of not starting at the very beginning, but segmenting to kind of the, f the second or third word in, then jumping to the sixth or seventh, and then kind of the 11th or 12th, so that you're taking in as much, as many words as you can within that span as quickly as possible. Is that the idea? Yes, because when your eye has a focus point, but it can also read peripherally, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It can also catch stuff. So when you focus your, and you can test this yourself, anytime look look at a, a look at a sentence anywhere in a book in a magazine focus on one word and see how many words you can see beyond that so if i'm looking at this book right now i'm looking at this word that says subtype but i can also see the word actually a and of thrombotics so right so with one quick look i can see five words really so you got to train slowly 
to find those because you waste a lot of time going from the first word to the second to the third to the fourth to the fifth. So what you do is you go from the third to the sixth to the ninth to the twelfth. And then those words, and you'll know, you'll know where, what your capacity is. And over time, by training that way, you got that peripheral view increases and you get to catch more words at the same time. Another very important thing is you can use a, um, like a ruler or a postcard or something to help you read down the lines. I know it sounds silly, like you're like a 10 year old or a five year old, but Believe me, it works because the brain or your eyes sometimes get confused and they go back to the same line, right? So you, you read all the way to the end and all of a sudden you come back and all of a sudden you're back on the top line again. And you're like, oh, wait, I'm on the wrong one. So now you wasted all that time. But when you do that over and over and over reading a book, it adds time, right? So what's your ruler though? Are you basically holding that about, say for example, you're reading one line across, you're going yeah. to have ruler marker two or three below right so that you can see a few lines ahead no. because no, no. oh because when i was teaching my kids to read this is in the uk they were saying i remember when my kids were kind of four and they the, the teacher was saying never put the ruler up against the sentence otherwise they can't see quickly beyond it and capture what's on the next line so it flows no it's it's better if you put it right under it oh, okay. because what happens is if you put it if you put it on the now you could do you could do one, so not right under, but the one under, so yeah. that you do save that time. But when you're almost finishing that last that sentence, you're already your hand is already sliding the card down, so it's re revealing okay. that other sentence. So when your eye goes to the left, you're already on that sentence. So it's it's a quick movement. It's it, it's a very flowing um, movement of your hand, and and again, at first I would say just practice slowly put the card, read the one sentence, try to make as many jumps as you can. And at the beginning, don't worry too much comprehension. Don't worry if you can get 100%. It's okay, it's practice. What I did when I started practicing this stuff, is if I had to read something that was important, I wouldn't speed read because I wasn't ready. But when I wanted to practice, I'm okay, I'm gonna practice speed reading. I will grab something that's, you know, like a news blog on the internet or, uh, a, a, a fiction book you know that I'm just reading for fun then I'll practice speed reading there because I knew the information wasn't really all that important so I would just you know just practice with that eventually I got I got really good so and and I know people that can read up to a thousand twelve hundred words per minute you know I haven't reached those um, levels I haven't practiced enough I don't think at the same time I don't really need to you really, really got to concentrate there. It's not like you're going to speed read and once you're good at it, you can speed read no matter what. No, you still have to focus and concentrate on what you're reading if you want to really absorb the information. So to kind of give people an idea, what would be an average speed, uh, an average, not speed reading, an average reading pace? Um, the average reader reads about 250 words per minute. 250 and you're saying the really advanced speed readers will read kind of over 1100 per minute yes. wow yeah. that's incredible and so if you wanted to train your brain to speed read i'm very interested in this and i'm sure many people listening and watching are how much time should you spend each day focusing on that skill of speed reading um, it's like everything it's like if you want to be better at soccer what do you do the more you train the better you get so you can do it one hour a day, you know, you could do it 30 minutes a day, you could do it every three days. The more you do it, the faster you can get to it. And the well, easier- Well, the brain tire very quickly. So do you need to kind of break that into say, right, I'm gonna practice speed reading for 20, 30 minutes, and then I'm gonna take a break. Because it's yeah. requiring a lot of concentration <clears throat> to develop. Oh yeah, it requires, yeah. So I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't do more than an hour a day when you start, um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's time consuming and it, it it does put a strain on your brain because you're like, because at, at the beginning you start, it's kind of like when you drive, you know, when you're young and you learn how to drive, you're like tense and you, you're scared to move your head. And you now 20 years later, you're like, which you shouldn't do, but you're texting on the phone, handling the thing, talking to people, yelling at your kids in the back. It becomes more an innate thing. The same, same thing is going to happen when you speed read, when you learn how to speed read, it's the same principle. It's like you're, 
at the beginning you're gonna be tense you're gonna be like focused on am i moving the card right am i jumping at the right spots you know eventually your eyes will automatically know where to jump it's like this you know it's a muscle memory mm -hmm. and you get used to it you get faster and, and and better at it so it's a little frustrating at the beginning but it's worth it if you want to you know consume books faster and ultimately presumably that is building a better brain because you're enhancing the speed of connections in mm. the brain oh yeah a hundred percent speed reading is better overall i rather I rather, you know, the guys that read 1,200 pages per minute are reading five times faster than a normal person, which means they can read five books by the other, while the other person reads one. So how much more information can you gain from reading five versus one book? Five times more pieces of information. So it's important. But also, they're not benefits for the brain overall as well, apart from the learning that you're developing from the book itself um, in terms of, is it enhancing the function of the brain in other areas? Is that a transferable? It's, it's like every, it's like saying you're playing piano. Yes, you're enhancing different areas of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, now, is that going to be better for, I don't know, uh, for you to play tennis? No, probably not. It, has not. it will have no effect on you in playing tennis. But it will have an effect on you on anything that has to do with reading or learning, you know. It, it, it does. Anything you do enhances your brain, a good or bad way. You know, if you create bad habits, it will enhance your brain in a bad way. Um, but everything you do creates a change in your brain um, in, the long, in the long run, no matter what you're doing, what you're learning, what activity you're performing. Um, and so would it be consistent then in terms of, because I know you have a, an amazing course on the learning machine. Yes, um, I have a course, course. Yeah, which I'll link to. Um, it's a, called Become a Learning Machine. Yeah, yeah, Become a Learning Machine. It's a, basically a course. It ha it's a seven-hour course I have online. Um, and what I do there is I teach all these techniques from speed reading, um, you know, like I said, chunking, recalling, dual coding, interleaving, um, all the techniques I cover and I tell you which ones are good, which ones are bad. So this course is ideal for anybody that wants to learn, especially for students that are in college or high school that want to learn more effectively, want to get those A's. It's a very effective techniques um, that work. You know, they, they work. I've used most of them. Now, here's the cool thing about techniques. You don't have to learn every single technique and apply all of them. Some techniques work better for others than you know, for example, flashcards never really worked for me. To yeah. me, what worked is like reading the book and summarizing stuff on a little piece of paper. That works better for me than a flashcard. Now, for some people, flashcards work better. For some people, underlining works better than writing things. Um, but there are some techniques I have. A, one of the videos I have there show you which techniques have been shown to be the best towards the worst. Like, for example, underlining is one of the worst techniques you can use. if That's all you're relying on. Underlining, yeah. So like, the, yeah, like grabbing your book and as you read, you underline the important things. Okay. It's one of the least effective techniques you can use. Now, if you're using underlining together with summarizing, together with chunking, together with a couple other techniques, then it all works in conjunction. Um, but uh, as a technique for itself, where you're like, I'm gonna grab this book and I'm gonna un underline my stuff and then that's it. No, it's it's almost. I remember it. So you yeah. need, if you're looking at a chapter of a book and you're underlining sections, you need to go back over that and then chunk that information out somewhere else. Yes, that, that's a technique I use. Um, like I like, I don't even underline. I don't like ruining books personally. Um, but what I do instead of underlining, I, I just write little pieces of information on a notepad of everything that I'm reading that I think it's important. Then I go back to those notes. If those notes are not 100% clear, like, hmm, I wrote this, why did I write this? I go back to the book, read the chapter or the, not the chapter, but the paragraph where I took that piece of information from and be like, ah, oh, that's why I wrote this. And so you'll link it, the page to your notes so you can quickly yes. go back, yeah. Okay. And then a final technique that I, I forgot to mention, but it's extremely important. It's very, very important to, um, do what's called spaced practice or spaced learning, which means 
you learn something today, tomorrow you got to review it. Then three days later, you review it again. Then a week later, then a month later, then a year later. In order for stuff to be recorded in your brain, you got to repeat it over and over again. But not repeat it like I'm going to repeat it five times today and then I'm done. No, that's good for taking the exam tomorrow morning. Yeah. But then three days later, a week later, you won't remember anything you studied for that exam. But if you want information to stick, you got to review that information over and over. And it, that's why it's called spaced practice because you got to give it space and every time make it a little longer. Mm -hmm. That way um, it sticks in your brain eventually. It creates that permanent uh, memory. And correct me if I'm wrong, but from the reading I've done as well is if you're trying to learn something, we were talking earlier about alcohol and you consume alcohol because that, disrupts REM sleep, so rapid eye movement, the dream sleep, which has an impact on learning, which is why when people have got, you know, wasted and they say, I can't remember anything from last night, in actual fact, that alcohol can impact your learning and assimilation of material, right? 100%. I mean, when, when you're under the influence of alcohol, your brain is not the same. It's not acting. I mean, think of how many people don't even remember stuff when they were drunk. I mean, that, that right there tells you that alcohol impairs your uh, memory formations right there. So I think there was a study done, wasn't there, where they took students who were learning things and they had to study during the day and some of them were allowed to have a drink at night and then others were completely teetotal. And what they found was the ones that had no alcohol during that period over day, so they weren't actually getting drunk, had a far better memory of the material than the ones who'd had alcohol. Yeah, well, yeah. exactly. Right. So that corroborates what we're saying, which is no. Now, there's people that become more creative and more enhanced with certain drugs. But the problem with that is even though that does work, it affects your brain in other ways. It deteriorates it. So in the long run, it's a cheap fix, right? Mm -hmm. Cheap fix. Like people that get high on Adderall just to, you know, get more attentive. You know, eventually that affects your brain in other ways and your system. So it's all, you know, like I said, I've never, not to um, brag, but I was a, an A student. I was the valedictorian of my university. I've never taken drugs. I've never done anything crazy. I just focused on my studies um, and focused on learning. You know, if you're learning, if you're learning what you really like, you have no problem learning it. If you're forced to learn stuff you don't like, you know, a lot of people I remember when I was doing biology, they didn't like chemistry. They hated chemistry, so they tend to fail. But that's, number one, you're already going with that mind frame. It's like, I hate chemistry, mm -hmm. right? But number two, you're they're learning something they're not really interested in, so it's harder, and I understand it. Um, I used to hate history when I was a kid. I could not, you could not make me learn history for anything, unless you put me in a movie or somebody actually told me the, the story behind it, but I did not like sitting down and reading a history book. Mm -hmm. So it made it harder for me to study it, right? Now, when I went to college, it's all classes of stuff that I was really passionate about. So it was really easy for me to study it. And that happens with anybody. If you're teaching, also there's a, a second part to that. It's that the teacher you have also can make or break your class. I've seen that many times. I was fortunate enough to know that when I had a bad teacher, I'm like, I knew this teacher is bad. I'm going to go do this on my own and figure it out on my, on my own. But some people don't do that. Don't realize to do that. And they're like, Oh, this teacher sucks. And I didn't learn anything. So I failed. I'm like, well, but when you have a good teacher, somebody that's teaching you really well, it makes your class interesting. It makes it pass. You know, how many times have you been sitting in front of a TV or something like, Oh, wow. It's already been an hour. It's because yeah. you, were, you were engaged, you were entertained, time flew. When you're watching a seminar of somebody that's putting your sleep, it like never ends because they're bad teachers. So yeah. that's yeah, very important. That's so one, one thing that I was um, really interested in when we were chatting before this is uh, the way that you use um, neuroscience and your knowledge um, and you're actually developing something you mentioned, which is going to be another course about how to understand the person you are and the people you're dealing with in terms of sales and persuasion. Um, yes. Yeah, so, it's very interesting. Can you elaborate? So one of the things I specialize in these days is persuasion techniques. Now, people confuse them with manipulation. 
Manipulation is the use of persuasion in a bad way, in my, and then persuasion is the use of um, uh, persuasion in a good way, you could say. Um, so, so it's a double-edged sword. So a lot of people use it to scam people, to, you know, to steal, to, you know, change opinions. Mm -hmm. You can learn all these techniques and be successful without, as long as you're ethical about it. So every time I teach, I put a disclaimer. I say, you know, everything I'm going to teach you can be used for good or for bad. So what I'm hoping is that everybody that's learning is using it for good. Um, but basically, in essence, is I teach techniques on how to uh, persuade people to take action, whether it's to buy a new product, whether it's to click on your video online, whether it's to buy your product on stage when you're talking, whatever it is. So I'm creating a curse, a course, not a curse, a course um, for persuasion. So like, uh, and it's going to be based mainly focused on online persuasion because it's a lot harder to persuade people online than in person. Mm -hmm. I can pretty much sell you everything in person. If you come and talk to me and I have a product, I'm almost positive I'm going to sell it to you or you're going to walk away with something. But online, it's a different story because they're not there. You're not there to convince people directly. So you have only those split seconds while they look at your page where, and, and to figure out what, are they trusting you? Is this something that you trust this page? Do you like this product? Is it interesting? And you have, you know, splits of seconds to make that decision to capture that idea. So part of the stuff I teach is how to enhance the websites for you to be able to um, capture those clients and keep them on your site longer till eventually they convert into a customer. And so in terms of trust, because as you say, that's much easier to do in person, face to face. What yeah. are um, the key ways that you can build trust um, either through video or through written content? Trust, there's a few components. Number one, knowledge. You're going to trust the person that has the right knowledge, right? So if I'm trying to sell you a, uh, I don't know, uh, a piece of software and I can't even show you how it works, you will be like, I don't, you know, I, I can't trust you. You don't even know your software. I don't want it, right? So trust, is, so knowledge is extremely important. Confidence is also very important, but goes together with um, knowledge. You're, if you're not confident um, about what you're saying or how you present your products, people are going to immediately shut, shut off um, their brains and they're going to fall into the, what, you know, the reptilian brain takes over and then you're not going to make any decisions. Um, and then they have to like you. If people don't like you, if, if, if you don't have people liking you where they like, you know, and it could be the way you look, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you express yourself. Now, not everybody's going to love you and like you in life, unfortunately but you got to figure out a way to maximize the way that people like you. So you need the, all those three components in order for people to build trust um, and say, yes, I'm buying from this guy or I'm listening to this guy or I'm going to do what he says. And then obviously authority, which comes with knowledge is very important, right? If I am a doctor in neuroscience and I tell you, I'm going to sell you this brain pill, you're most likely going to trust what I'm going to tell you about it. Even if I'm selling you baloney, because I have the authority behind it. Versus if a car mechanic, no offense to any car mechanic, says, hey, I developed the brain pill. You know, yeah. would you like to buy it? And be like, well, what, what are your credentials? So authority is very important too. Vice versa, I'm a doctor and I decide to start a blog on car mechanics. People are going to be like, well, what do you know? You know, how long you've been a mechanic? Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that people can do other stuff and become experts at it. But once you become an expert at something, now you got that authority, you got those credentials, so people tend to trust you more. There's super interesting studies where they, they do fake news, but the guy, for instance, the guys who have a microphone, a big camera behind him, he's wearing a suit, says he works for, an ABC, for a, a news channel, and then gives people complete bogus news, like, the president just died, what's your opinion? And people are like, oh, oh my God, really? and they believe it. They immediately believe it. Why? Because he has the authority behind everything, right? He everything as we are pattern seekers and um we we do everything based on past experiences when we look at the guy that tells us the president died we're like okay he's a news guy he has a camera he has the camera behind him, he has a microphone he's wearing a suit he's 
obviously a, a news guy, so I'm going to believe what he tells me. And that's uh, yeah, very that's important. So authority is very important. Yeah. And what I about gotta, in terms... Oh, sorry. No, yeah, you have another... No, I got to go get my kid again. You want to <laughs> wait another half hour and we finish? Yeah. Okay, sure. Okay. Just let me go grab it. So yeah, so that um, the sales and persuasion course sounds um, amazing actually. Um, just combining that neuroscience with what you know and how the brain works and how we can build that trust um, with somebody. Because it is actually, as you say, much more difficult to do that online. Um, what's the main kind of focus of the course in terms of who are you gearing this at? Is it geared at entrepreneurs or marketing teams? Um, what's the kind of focus? It's really for everybody. Um, so anybody can really benefit. Entrepreneurs can really benefit. A marketing group can totally benefit because we're, you know, the approach we're doing with the marketing course, I mean, with the sales course, it's, it's a neuroscience approach. So we're using science-backed information to say, this is what really works. You know, why, are we, why, why do we want to use this color? Because studies show that this color does X, Y, Z. Mm. Um, why do you want to use a phrase this way or why you want to present information here versus here? Because the science shows that um, it works this way. Um, so really anybody from a salesperson that someone, you know, like a medical sales equipment guy can benefit from it to um, anybody wanting to negotiate with, you know, you're a lawyer with the, uh, the divorce lawyer. I don't know. Um, I actually used to teach a class in North Carolina for continuing education for lawyers, which was on persuade, how to persuade a jury um, and the judge. So techniques on how to talk to the jury and what to say, not to say, so that you can lean that uh, the, the, the jury and the judge in your favor for, you know, that final verdict. So it's pretty interesting. So anybody can really use it. Anybody. Even even with children, I remember when I was practicing oh, law, I had a, a part, one of my fellow partners was having a discussion with someone, I can't remember if it's on the other side or a client, and they were really, really kind of kicking off at her. And she was like, I'm going to be honest with you. I had a harder time from my four-year-old this morning <laughs> than oh, yeah. you're giving me right now. I use persuasion with my kids all the time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's part of me. I'm not trying to... I mean, sometimes you could say I'm manipulating them a little bit, but um, in general, it's just trying to figure out a way to persuade them so that they feel they're doing it. It's not coming from me, but from them, you know, so they feel yeah. empowered to make those decisions because that's ultimately what you want to do. When you are persuading people, you don't want to force them. No. You want to trick them into doing something they will regret because they'll never buy from you again. And you don't want to sell them something that, you sell them this beautiful package and then they get this crappy, you know, um, you know, it's kind of like you look at the picture of a McDonald's hamburger on the picture and it looks beautiful. And then you go buy it and it's this squashed up little, yeah. nothing, <laughs> right. Well, good. that's, that's persuasion. You know, that's manipulation right there. It's like, they're telling you, this is what it looks like. And then you go get it. It's like, mm. um, so you don't want to do any of that stuff if you want people to continuously buy from you. Your stuff has to be legit. It has to be genuine. You've got to be very genuine in order to sell successfully. Now, some people can mask very well, you know, um, they're, even if they're not genuine, but rare. Not, not a lot of people can really do that. Eventually, people know. Eventually, people feel it. And like I said, if you have a bad product, the reviews will say it, people will stop buying it, you know, so you got to change it up. Yeah, no, absolutely. But um, it is for everybody. I think anybody can benefit from it. Cool. And that is being launched kind of the back end of this year. Yes. Into it. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. What I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. Hopefully my uh, ADD will not get too much in my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so what are your tricks for managing ADD and kind of enhancing focus one of the things I was I'm really interested in is you mentioned nutrition right at the outset as the very first thing that was important mm -hmm. for the brain and what can we eat and what can we take in the form of supplements I know you actually have a very cool supplement Neuro 67 that you've developed 
Um, what are the key things from our nutrition and, and so I got, Yeah, so, so I got two key supplements. I got the brain pill, which is more, the so Neuro 67 is more for enhancing your focus, increasing your memory abilities. That, so it's a great supplement for those who want to take it a little notch above you know the average it, it will give you that um that extra kick now and this is where i tell everybody you're not going to be einstein by taking a brain pill i don't care who's selling what out there in the market i truly believe we have one of the best formulas in the market i've seen and studied all of them there's nothing out there that you'll take and the next day you'll be einstein or you're a genius and you can memorize a million words it doesn't work that way it's like everything else. It's like vitamins. You take them, you know they work, but you don't really feel them. With brain pills, it's the same way. Now, if you get people that say, oh, I feel amazingly awesome, you know, the next day, it's mainly a placebo effect or an ingredient in the pill like caffeine or something that really boosts, boosts your brain, but it's not really doing much other than just boosting your brain um, to get that kick so that you can say, I got that kick. Um, so don't be fooled by it. There is, in, including, it's amazing, amazing. Yesterday I was showing my brother-in-law on YouTube how many fake videos are online using my brand, Neuro67, to direct you to buy some other crappy formula. Okay. I mean, oh, yeah. Go to YouTube, go on YouTube.com. Okay. Type in Neuro67. You'll, see, you'll even see videos with my face on it, but I'm not talking. It's somebody else talking. They just stole all our stuff because they know our formula is good to put it in front of you. So that when you click on their link, it takes you to another pill that's not ours. That's, you know, some bogus formula that somebody created. But there's tons of them, tons of them. Fake review sites just to get you to buy another product, but they use our name to direct you to it. It's, it's, it's crazy. See, that's the art of manipulation yeah absolutely at its core 100 yeah. percent. i mean it's horrible and i can't it's so hard to stop it it's you you might get one video down and then the next day there's five yeah, new ones say, it's there. impossible to police it's impossible so hopefully if you're watching the only place you could get neuro 67 from is neuro 67.com only there's like i've okay. seen not like, on amazon can you buy it on amazon or? no i'm, oh, I'm okay. not on amazon Neuro67.com only plays. I, yesterday I saw a site that was, I think, online.neuro67.com. That's not my site. Um, you know, there's lots of sites like that. So I will link to neuro67.com in the show notes. Um, yeah. The other product that I have, which for nutrition purposes, it, I think it's great, especially if you're trying to lose weight or you want to eat a little healthier. Um, mm -hmm. I have Lean67. I'm looking for it. I thought I had a tub right here. We can pause for a second. Meal replacement, you can see right there. And again, okay. it's lean67.com. And this is a plant-based uh, supplement that I created um, last year. It's expensive, but it's guaranteed one of the best in the market. It has all kinds of good stuff. Um, it's made 100% with uh, plant hemp so mm -hmm. it's hemp protein and pea protein blend for the protein it has superfoods like maca and acai and alfalfa from argentina we have coral calcium we have a whole bunch we kind of went all over the world and figure out what were the best ingredients in different areas of the country that were kind of superfoods and then added it all in there into this amazing meal and it has zero sugar i use stevia for it and on our test studies it came number two right under one product that had a lot of sugar actually so i think that's why they beat me <laughs> um, but it's a it's a great now what do i think of supplements i believe in supplements obviously um in fact if you look at my desk i have you know, here's a 5-HTP. It's not mine, but I take it. It's a mood enhancer. Makes me happier. I got the... At night, 5-HTP or...? I take it. I take it anytime. Anytime. I don't, I don't necessarily... Yeah. This is 100 milligrams of HTP. This is a Vitality supplement that I got. These ones are super expensive. 
Um, what else I have here? Here, I don't have anything else. Um, I got this other one called a another different dietary supplement. So I, I take supplements. Obviously, I research them before I take them. That's one of the biggest problems. What do you, do you take those? Because they're meant to be you know, great for brain health in terms of DHA. And Which ones? Oh. Three supplements, yeah. I got my own. Oh, you have your own. Amazing. Yeah. I got Omega 67. Omega 67, okay. Yep. And that one, so when you're taking Omega, one of the things you got to be careful. So Omega has, it's, it's a fatty acid, right? And there's two that are important, the EPA and the DHA. And there's other ones, but those are the two important that your body can really break down. Now, EPA is the most important one for your brain. Now, a lot of times when you go to the supermarket and buy this stuff, so you see this bottle, I sell this one for 20 bucks. And you go to the supermarket and you find one for 10. You're like, oh, Omega-3 for $10 versus 20. I'd rather buy the $10 one. Here's the thing. What concentrations of Omega it has in that same pill? Because I can guarantee you that it's going to have a very low EPA content. Mm -hmm. It's going to have a higher DHA content and in general, just less omega per pill. So we have, you're getting 1200 milligrams of omega per pill you take, 800 of which are EPA. And when you go to supermarket, you might get one that has 150 or 100 EPA and 200 uh, DHA, which it, it works. But obviously this is like five times. Oh, yeah. Um, um, and also the supermarket ones are often kind of rancid, right? They've been heat. I mean, it's, you have to be very careful with what you're taking in terms of fish oil because those fats are unstable. I know they have antioxidants with them, but they have yeah. to be stored correctly. But they, they, they last long enough. I mean, you can have, this, this bottle can last you a year, no problem, these um, pills, um, which it will work. But yeah, but you're right. You know, it's like, make sure you look at the expiration date you know that it didn't expire five years ago obviously you're not going to die but it might not have any effect on you because the molecules might be a little broken down and you know and just do nothing so um but supplements like i said i truly believe in supplements um and they are key part of my diet our, our family's diet you know my kids take kids multivitamins and they actually take there is I, it's not mine but i have a kids omega it has less quantities or little balls that it's easier to swallow for them um and that's but you got to do all this in conjunction with having a good diet you can in my book i recommend I, it's called i call it the dr fresco plate which is uh, my dietary recommendations of what you should eat every day um which is slightly different or quite different from what the government, at least in the U.S., you know, there's that government plate. Have mm -hmm. you seen that one? Yeah, yeah. I think well, we have a very similar one in the U.K., and I kind of have my own plate too as a nutritionist. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's based mostly around grains and carbs um, here. I think the U.S. plate is the same. Yeah, they have very high content in carbs. I think they recommend up to 300 grams of sugar per per day or something which i think it's insane mm -hmm. um if you talk to ben greenfield he says i don't recommend more than 25 grams a day of sugar yeah. total um i recommend 50 25 is extremely hard to keep up with you know somebody like ben greenfield who's a you know an expert athlete um is used to eating like that but somebody you know a normal person saying you can only have 25 grams of sugar it's almost like saying you can't hardly eat anything um just when you i mean say sugar they, here, do you mean actually carbohydrate or yes. do you mean added Carbo sugar? carbohydrate carbohydrates are sugars so yeah, they are sugars but i just meant i was trying to work out whether you meant kind of no, no, total because total. i think even ben now when i last spoke to him he's now kind of he he might have a refeed where he'll have more often in the evening um okay. i think yeah it can be really 25 as you say very low it's very low so my i say 50 maximum okay um per day total not just sugar added because yeah, you, know, you have a big pasta bowl that's you know 400 grams of sugar plus 50 added sugars now you're eating 450 grams of sugar because for those of you watching whether you eat bread, rice, you know, sugar from the table, a soda, honey, whatever, everything turns out, uh, converts into glucose and fructose molecules. 
And that's basically what it is. So when I say total sugar, it means that includes the sugar that's coming in your salads or um, a fruit. Like that's why I say 25 is very low because a medium apple has about what, 15 grams of sugar, I believe. Um, so that means if you eat two, two apples in one day, that's it. That's all your sugar limitation for the whole day, which means now you can't even eat pepper on your salad or um, there's, you can't have any grains, no yams, no you know, sweet potato, nothing because you already exceeded. Um, fruit is another thing that people don't realize, but fruit is very... Excuse me, sorry. Fruit is very, um, it, it, there's a lot of things out there where people say, oh, as long as you're eating fruit, you're fine. I actually did personal tests with me. I actually hooked up a glucose monitor permanently for four months in my body to see the effects of all different kinds of food. And one of the tests I did is I said, I, you know, there's fruitarians, people that only eat fruit. So I did a test where I said, okay, my meal is going to be only fruits. My glucose levels went off. Did they? Yeah. Oh, man, it was like yeah. 180, 200, right? It's too much sugar. You got to think 500 years ago, people didn't have access to that many sugar, uh, fruits. You know, not only that, today we select for sweeter fruit. So mm -hmm. right now we plant a tree that's apple and it's like, oh, this one's sweeter than this one. Let's keep breeding the sweet ones until it's sweeter and sweeter. I guarantee you a hundred years ago, an apple was so sour, you know, it had sugar, but it was very sour. Fruits were a lot more sour back then. We just keep selecting for sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. There's, there's these grapes in America called cotton candy grapes. Oh my God. <laughs> they are so addictive. They are the good thing is they only come in August. That's the only time they're produced in August. It's, I guess, it's very hard for them to grow other than August when okay. they can be harvested. They are, oh my God, they're like total bliss point of, of taste. It's like anybody that tries those uh, grapes, they're like, I love those grapes because they're so sweet it, and they taste like cotton candy, 100%. Wow. <laughs> but those grapes were selected for. They're breeding those specific grapes that have, I guarantee you, that grape has double the sugar of a normal, uh, normal grape. So fruits have a lot of sugar. It's good to eat fruit. Obviously, it's much better eating fruit than having the fruit juice because now you're taking all the fibers out. Yeah, absolutely. So, so at least when you're digesting your uh, fruit, you know, the fiber helps release the sugar slower in your system, which helps with a lower spike in your insulin levels but still when when i had fruit diets my uh, sugar levels went up the roof that's why in my recommendation is that you have two three fruits a day so like with your dinner you can have an apple or you can have a banana or you have like a you know handful of grapes and then again for lunch and maybe for a snack another fruit but that's about it uh, i wouldn't say you need to eat much more fruit obviously between fruit and candy, give your kids fruit, you know, all the way, right? Because candy is just pure sugar with nothing added. At least fruit have minerals and uh, essential, yeah, and yeah, trace minerals. They have um, vitamins, they have fiber, they have different stuff that, you know, it's better than just oh, I think a lot of people, a lot of adults are still eating too much fruit. I see that a lot with my clients when they say they can't lose weight often. And, you know, if they're rushing out the house, then the first thing they'll do is grab two, three pieces of fruit. And it's like, no, 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 that is not the right way to start. Yeah, the day. And I think so people don't realize that. And they feel they're being healthy. It's like, oh, I'm being healthy. I'm drinking an oranges. I'm eating fruit. I'm eating dinner. I'm like, no, you're not. If you had the contents of sugar that you consume today, you know, and I, I, I've done videos where I show you visually how much sugar is in each thing that you're eating, like on a normal diet. It's like a pot. It's like, I'm telling you, three, 400 grams of sugar. It's almost this full pot of sugar, like in one day. That's it's crazy. crazy. It's crazy. Wow. And people take it. One Coca-Cola can has 35 grams of sugar. That means... You can drink one, you can't even drink two a day that you're already over my recommended limits, you know, and that's just one can. And that's assuming everything else you're not going to, you, you can't add any more sugar. 
So then people want their own. those limits at all in terms of like athletic clients. So how, how much they are um, exercising. What was the question? Sorry, do you adapt when you, when you talk about 50 grams maximum yeah. carbohydrates, do you adapt that in terms of a more athletic population? Oh. That's obviously for just people who are, you know, just normal. Of course, people yeah, yeah. Are, this is a yeah. Rec recommended daily. Of course, if you have like a guy like um, Phelps, who mm -hmm. consumes about ten thousand calories a day, he definitely has more room. Yeah, exactly. In carbs and fruits and sweets than we do, mm -hmm. right? So obviously, when when I say fifty grams, good good thing you mentioned it. It is for the average person. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> person that has normal activity if you work out a lot every day obviously that's why i recommend testing all the time i think people should take tests like i know my normal resting rate consumption of calories is about 1450 so 1450 calories so that means if i wake up i don't do anything i don't go exercise i just walk around the house I, i'm on my computer i eat i go out i consume about 1450 calories but if I add <clears throat> running every day where I, let's say, consume another 500 calories, now I know I can consume up to 20, uh, 1950 calories and I'm going to be okay. I'm not going to gain any weight. So that's why it's also important that people are trying to lose weight. It's like how much calories are you really spending every day? Yeah. And how much are you spending extra if you do exercise so you know what to eat? Because if you... If I've been to restaurants like Cheesecake Factory. Now they have all the calories on all their meals. There's some meals that are like 1,400 calories, one meal. One meal, wow. One meal. So I'm like, and, and some of them are salads. There's a salad that had 1,200 calories, mainly because of the dressing. But I'm like, so you go in there thinking, I'm being so healthy, I'm eating a salad. Well, that salad was 1,200 calories. If it was me on a resting day, I only have 200 calories left to eat for the rest of the day before I start gaining weight again. And that's what people don't realize. So I'm like, no, they don't. I don't underestimate it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so sedentary. A lot of people are. You got to understand your, how your body works. You got to do the tests, at least some basic testing like that. Like what's your minimum consumption rate? Mm -hmm. You know, my wife's consumption rate is about 1200 calories. Mm -hmm. So, I can eat more than her without gaining, gaining weight, right? She's a lot more lean. She's more petite. So it's obviously different. So if we're doing recommendations, we can't all eat the same. Yeah. Right? We, my kids can't eat the same as I eat. They eat less. They're a lot smaller. Their um, rate of absorption and the consumption is much less. So if my kid is eating the same hamburger I'm eating, he's going to gain weight a lot faster than, you know, than we want him to gain weight because it's too much food for him so now kids are a lot more energetic so for example my 10 year old's resting rate um calories is about 1900 because kids are just naturally more yeah more they're happy. always moving aren't they that's the thing and i think that Their metabolism that is faster so he could technically eat more than i do right and but, also he's growing so yeah, that's one thing. So their metabolism is so much more accelerated, so they they have more room. Yeah. But eventually, once you reach that 25, 30 years of age, you, that starts slowing down, and that's when you start seeing the, the big change. I used to be a gymnast. Mm -hmm. I was extremely fit and lean. You know, I'm not fat now by any means, but uh, my body's not what it was when I was 20, 100%. You know, it's like I was always ripped eating whatever crap you can put in front of me and nothing would happen to me. Mm -hmm. um, now I got to watch everything I eat. It's if I start eating, like when I go to Argentina, I'm from Argentina originally. When I go visit Argentina, I usually gain five to 10 pounds in a week because obviously everybody wants to feed you and you're eating all the stuff that you grew up with. And then I have to come back and suffer for two weeks until it goes back to me. <laughs> That's a cultural thing, isn't it? My father's yeah. Lebanese. And if, you, if I see his family, they want you to eat all the time. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay, great. So, um, amazing, amazing tips there. In terms of nutrients specifically, I just kind of want to finish on that um, because one of the things I look at is I find that 
I, I've noticed, I've observed this with my clients and I've observed this myself, is that carbohydrates can actually, even if they're not, you know, simple sugars, but they're faster burning carbohydrates can actually almost turn you into what I would call a kind of carb coma and make you very, very lethargic. And I think that's part of the reason that people will snack in the evening if they're watching TV or something, because it's quite relaxing. It's not going to, you're not going to feel like doing much, but also we can apply that during the day because I've certainly found um, that if you avoid carbohydrates at lunchtime and stick to vegetables and salads and protein and fats, you have lasting energy all afternoon. Um, oh, yeah. Carbohydrates don't necessarily translate into being more energetic. The other thing is when you wake up, I mean, when you're in the morning or at lunchtime, you naturally have more energy. Your body is more inclined to use a lot of that energy to digest. So as the day progresses, and this is not just for digestion, for everything in your body, you're, that's why I always tell people, do your hardest tasks in the morning and leave the hard, the easy ones at night because your brain is already exhausted. You don't want to, and, and the same way that your body works with your digestion and everything, it's because it's, you start consuming energy and your body starts t getting tired. So your body starts deciding, where do I want to put my energy now? Mm -hmm. Do I want to put my energy more into the brain? Do I want to put my energy more into here? Do I have to fight this little microbe that I got into the system? You know, everything changes. So, the more tired you are, the more likely. Have you ever been so busy all day, blah, 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 and then at the end of the day, you get sick? Like, like the, the day passes or after a very important exam that you took in college, that next day you're like sick. You get a fever. You're like super yeah. sick. It's because you're, you're focusing all your energy to trying to do one thing. And because you're focusing all your energy, you didn't have enough energy to focus on your, say, your immune system. So at the end of the day, when everything's done, your body goes into a collapse mode. It's like, oh, now everything's coming out because now you're getting sick. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when it's best to go to bed, go to sleep. I have many times had fevers. I don't take anything. Just go to bed and wake up three, four hours later. Fever's gone. I feel like new again. It's just my body needed to really divert some of that energy into fighting stuff because you have a certain amount of energy. So no matter how you look at it, it's like, it's not like we're going to reserve this energy just for this to fight diseases. No, it's whatever. If you're using all your energy to run and do this, that energy is not going to be used to fight the diseases right now because you're diverging. You're using it up for something else. So at the end of the day, that's why night it's so important that when you go to sleep, that's when all the energy gets used to all these um, to, to maintain homeostasis on your body, to like, you know, work on digesting, work on eliminating microbes, work on detoxifying your brain because you're not using the energy for anything else. That's why when you're sick, go to bed and sleep. Yeah, so important, so powerful. Well, thank you so much um, for coming on and sharing so much wisdom. You've given a lot of, a lot of time to this and I really appreciate it. I think um, everyone listening is going to really enjoy all of these tips and the science um, and the biohacks on how to really enhance your brain, uh, not just today, but for the long term and for life. Um, where can people find you? Where can I link to, um, where can sure. they go find your supplements and your website? And um, your so again, my pleasure, but uh, you can find me. So my personal website is drfresco.com yes. and it's not Dr. Fresco, it's spelled out D O C. T O R Fresco, F R E S E O dot com. So, drfresco dot com. You can find, I'm not selling supplements there. It's supplements, it's hard to sell online because the merchant I'm using doesn't really like selling supplements. So, I'm just selling my book and my courses there. Um, but you can find my supplements at lean67.com or neuro67.com. Okay. Um, and then you can always email me info at drfresco.com. If you have any questions or anybody that has any questions, I'm very open to answering. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Dr. Fresco, Instagram, Dr. Fresco. Uh, I'm in all the platforms. Uh, and I'm, like I said, I'm always open to answering any type of questions as long as I have the knowledge for it, obviously. So I, it's funny. The other day I had somebody ask me, um, how do they how can they make their nipples lighter I'm like, <laughs> like 
I have very dark, I have very dark nipples. I want to make, I'm like, you're asking the wrong dude. So it's not my area. Yeah, it's not, I get so my many, I've, I've had questions about pregnancy. Now some basic stuff, obviously I know, but yeah. um, some people just, they hear the word doctor and they're like, well, yeah. let me ask you about, you know, this pimple I have in my arm. I'm like, that's not my expertise. So um, I used to get the same thing as a lawyer. You know, I was an M and A lawyer, corporate lawyer, and I'd be asked, you know, what about this land thing with property or my divorce yeah. or something <laughs> like that? It's, it's not my area of expertise. Yeah. It's like I'm getting divorced. What should I do? I'm like, I don't know. It's no, not it my so, I mean, I try to help everybody as much as I can. Uh, sometimes it's just for me to do a quick search online, and I can still answer the question because it's basic. But um, again, if I can answer, I will. I, I'm here to answer anything that, you know, that I'm an expert on that anybody has a question for. So again, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I will link to all of that and also to your book, Train Your Brain for Success. Yes. Right. My book, you can find it on my website or that one is on Amazon. I have it in, in Amazon, Amazon. Yeah. I also have it in Spanish is the orange version. Um, for those of you who prefer it in Spanish. Uh, I have the Kindle version, the print version, the hardcover version, and I have the audible version as well. Amazing. So, and it is a fantastic say, book. Nice into the things we talked about today. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I did all the formats because as, as one came out, I was like, do you have it in audio version? I'm like, no, but I will. Do you have the Kindle? No, but I will. And, you know, so I got all the versions. So there's no excuses for you not to get the book if you want it. <laughs> yeah, the audio version is quite unique. I think it has a bit of music in it, and it's quite yeah, unique. I've used, which is interesting. I've had I've gotten some bad reviews because of that. Right. Um, you know, me personally, the way I learn, I like that those mm -hmm. sounds, and and that's why I did it that way. Because I'm like, you know, as a neuroscientist, I'm like, how can I make this more learning like? So it's like, so if you have sounds effects and and you know. It, it's more appealing because now you're linking again, dual coding. You're you're listening, but at the same time you're imagining what that person is with that noise, right? So if you hear birds chirping and I'm talking about breakfast, you're imagining the birds and breakfast and being in the morning. But unfortunately, some people I guess are too um, focused on, on on reading, you know, very quietly or whatever that they they give me bad reviews because of that. They're like, oh, it's a, this book is great, but if, if it wasn't so distracting because of all the noises and the background music. So I am thinking of doing a version of the same book without it, all the uh, sounds just for those people. Um, but again, you don't know. Until learn right. Right? Yeah, exactly. See me, I prefer it that way. And I thought, um, you know, that it made sense, but, not everybody likes it so <laughs> but nonetheless it is whichever way you decide to read it it's a great book um okay. so thank you so much for coming on thank you take care have a good day bye